You know, ever since Michael Brown's killing by police in Ferguson and Eric Garner's death while being arrested in Staten Island, there has been increased tension between police and their communities, especially uh, communities of color. In just the past few days, just to show you as an example, in the last two days, really, we've seen three new situations, none of them directly tied to the region, but just to give an idea to the heightened tensions. In Fort Lauderdale, the NAACP demanding an investigation after four officers were allegedly texting racist messages to each other and posting racist videos. Those cops all gone from the force. To Alabama, federal judge, um, a grand jury, excuse me, has just indicted an officer who's accused of using unreasonable force against an unarmed Indian man. The cop accused of slamming him to the ground while he was going for a walk. That man, that grandfather now, partially paralyzed. And in California, Empire star Taraji Henson now apologizing to the Glendale Police Department after she accused them of racially profiling her son during a traffic stop. The actress apologized after police released dash cam video, which contradicted those accusations. And again, just an idea and a snapshot of a weekend, examples that we've really seen here, especially in the last six months. Are we seeing a widening divide between police and residents? Well, let's bring in our guest, Darren Porcher. He joins the panel. He's a retired NYPD lieutenant, and um, you're also dealing um, at John Jay here um, with folks, um, police officers themselves to this. So let me ask you, is this anything new, um, or is just the heightened attention uh, bringing more of these cases uh, under the spotlight? Well, it's a combination of the two. It is nothing new. We've always had instances of police use of force that has been problematic within police culture. However, when we think about the heightened sense of what occurred in the Eric Gardner case, where we didn't have an indictment, it just basically elevated the tension in connection with police and community relations here in, in the United States, for that matter. Well, let's talk about some possible solutions, and none of them are easy, and for many, not too popular. But you were a lieutenant in the NYPD. Who would have a better chance relating to folks in Bed-Stuy? A cop who's got to live in the community? Um, or a cop of color or maybe a white cop that lives in Rockland? Um, I, you know, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but the idea is that I've heard residency requirements and almost you know, diversity requirements, that they're more reflective of the communities they police in. Would those two things make a big difference? Well, I think when you have uh, a culture of police that assimilates that of the population that they police, I think that that's a good thing. When we think about residency requirements, we look at places like Long Island, for example, Nassau and Suffolk County, they have residency requirements. So I, do I believe residence requir residency requirements would be a good thing in New York City? I do think so. In connection with the communities of color, would they, would they be happier if they're policed by people that assimilate themselves? I think that that would be a plus. Now, granted, an officer that's hired to, uh, as, an, as a sworn police officer will, it is responsible for police in the community, whether they're black, white, uh, Latino, et cetera. However, um, with the climate that we have in play right now, connection with Gardner, any other series of alleged abuse of force uh, activities, I believe that the communities, um, the police department should reflect the communities mm -hmm. that they police. Dom, you've interviewed both uh, Ed Mullins and Pat Lynch uh, mm -hmm. pretty recently. Saw I Pat just, Lynch Saturday night. I could just see them literally um, exploding through the TV screens mm -hmm. at what I said, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. how much of a difference do you think it would make? I mean, you've talked at length here, your own personal experiences from growing up in, in the projects here to obviously mm -hmm. now across the river, if you will, mm -hmm. and seeing different... Should the, com should the police department reflect the population that they serve? You know, it, it's a great question. And I know you're going to say that's why you asked it. Yeah. But living in Rockland County now in a predominantly uh, mostly white area, I, I don't know. I, I just feel that the officers there in Rockland, that I just feel like they treat the citizens of the community much different than the NYPD does. Now, there's less crime, I'm sure, in Rockland, but it just seems that they're very professional. If they come to my home, it's, yes, sir, or, sir, they, they, this is why I'm here. And I just feel that sometimes you don't get that with the NYPD, and that brings me to my point of, and maybe the lieutenant can answer this, what role does the community play? Because I agree with you that police officers should look like, in some cases, the communities that they patrol, but I've had many black cops tell me and I'm quoting now, we hate patrolling the zoo. People are so disrespectful. Black cops, not white cops, 
people are so disrespectful. And white communities were treated with, with enormous respect, respect, but in some black communities were treated like garbage. So what role does the, from your point of view, does the community play? I think the community plays an exceptionally large role here. When we think about how, just let's look at uh, police departments. Police departments are public, uh, they, they're municipal, excuse me, municipal agencies. We have a mayor that's elected. The elected mayor appoints a police commissioner. That mayor is elected based on an electorate that puts him or her into office. So when we think from that perspective, the police department are public servants. So the community has a right to get what they ask for. So if the community states, look, we have a problem with this, we want that, then the community should get it. And they will get it because if they don't, they're going to vote the person out that's in office. And so when we have uh, candidates, um, de Blasio, we have, I say he's been in for a year now. When you look towards his second and third year, he's going to look to court citizens for, um, for votes for, um, for standing for a second term. And if the community says, look, this is what they want, this is the platform, then the mayor will stress to the police commissioner that this is what the agenda is moving to the next Richard, time. let me just ask a quick follow-up. because, uh, So I, well, here's what I don't understand. What cops have told me consistently is, listen, Dominic, I want to go home tonight and see my family as well. So how do we close that gap in communities of color where, frankly, you have black-on-black -black crime, and then you have the officers that are there, and many don't want to be there based on past experiences. So how do you close that gap? That's the question. Police community, in, com police community relations are paramount. The police need to be more involved with these communities than just from an enforcement perspective. Because when we look at the average officer, 90%, 80 to 90% of the job is service related. 10 to 15% is enforcement related. We need to have more interaction with, these, with the community, with the police, such as softball games. Now, do we have this? Yes. We look at the Police Athletic League. We look at the Community Affairs Bureau. Those, are, those entities are fine, but we just need to expand on that. Because whenever I turn on the television, I hear about crime stats. I hear about, um, I hear about shootings, stabbings, murders, etc. But I never hear about police community relations. So I think that that component needs to be elevated. One last question. I know we're way over, but Lieutenant, um, it's funny. We've had officers of color that have sat in there. In fact, um, uh, commanders that have sat in that chair saying they told their kids uh, about, they've had the talk, right, about how to act uh, when the police, how they're supposed to behave different than a conversation my old man ever had with me as a white guy about it. So we've learned, especially through this, the broader population, that race does matter. However, I've heard, even this past weekend, the recent incident where police respond um, to a call where a woman took a screwdriver and tried to stab a social worker. They go there, the woman takes a screwdriver and goes after them. They shoot her and fatally kill her. And then the questions are, police, do they use inappropriate force and everything else? There's a population that you're hearing probably more than we are from cops saying we can't win anymore. No matter what we do, our actions are always put under a microscope. Is that the consensus from cops right now that maybe because of the actions in Staten Island or in Ferguson, Missouri or in Cleveland or whatever, that all cops right now are under a microscope? Well, police, do you have some officers that feel that they are on, are on the microscope? Absolutely you do. However, I'm a firm believer and a firm advocate and police departments need to constantly retool their strategy in dealing with the public to make things better. Because if we stay at a certain point and say, look, this is, we're okay with this and we're resistant to change, we'll consistently have these problems and we will not um, have an evolution and change in the culture within the police department. So I see it as more of a cultural issue in the department. Um, well, beginning of a conversation here at the table. Ten, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And on this subject, uh, Dominic, uh, this Wednesday, we'll be sitting down interviewing Eric Garner's daughter, Erica Garner. We're going to play it right here for you on RFL, that conversation, Dominic's 101, this coming Wednesday. Uh, when we come back, we will switch gears. By the way, keep it down over there, Jeannie. Uh, critics are saying that Indiana's new so-called religious freedom law is all about discrimination. But the governor of that state says, hey, this is all about tolerance. We'll be right back.